and how did you make that connection, Bruce, for the, for the um, developing sort of physios that are tuning in um, yeah. and wanting, wanting to work up the ranks? Yeah, well, I mean, sport was my, always my passion and, and sports physio was the direction I thought I'd always want to go. Um, yeah. About halfway through the degree over in here in Perth, I, I knew I wanted to go home to Melbourne. Um, I'd actually done a, uh, a little prac at, at West Coast and so made some connections with the physios there. Um, and when I decided I wanted, to go, wanted to go home, I basically reached out to those guys and they gave me the list of every physio in the AFL and all their email addresses. So I basically I emailed every club um, to try and get a, a gig somewhere. Um, and I mean, obviously, not many clubs want to take on a new grad, but uh, Bruce had his uh, had his clinic on the side and um, was willing to uh, to take me on. And uh, yeah, so I worked I worked there for a year, and I also worked with um, some guys who were at the Saints at the time as well down in Cheltenham. Other mentors or influences that helped shape your, your <clears throat> career? You sound like you're pretty self driven, but um, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, from a physio point of view, uh, when I came back over here. A um, couple of years into my, my career, I, I, I got the opportunity to work at Body Logic Physiotherapy um, and the um, owner of that clinic is Peter O'Sullivan, who is quite well regarded in the um, management of sort of low back pain and, and chronic pain. Um, very, very well researched um, around, around the world, really. During that sort of six to seven years, have there been have you sort of refined the methods to transfer it to more AFL appropriate? Like you mentioned some guys with shoulder issues um, or maybe wrist issues that, that don't partake, but what about the guys that do? Um, how is it different to what you see on, on YouTube, like you mentioned? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of floor based work in terms of crawl, mobility crawls, um, rolling, um, some sort of rolling and tackle technique work. Um, and obviously back in the day, we'd do a little bit more sort of floor-based mobility and, and stretching, um, whereas we found this is a bit of bit of both. So you're getting a bit more bang for your buck in terms of efficiency. A lot of the guys are all about getting in and out these days at the club. So if you can, if you can throw in a, a drill where they're crawling through range and you're actually getting some good hip mobility work as well as upper body weight-bearing proprio work, all in the one exercise, um, it's actually, it transfers pretty well and that's become part of our sort of pre-training routine. If I'm working with this club, for instance, you know, our guys aren't professional athletes, you know, they're not spending time in the gym and as much time on recovery. Um, do you have any advice for, you know, trying to get the best bang for your buck? So working with a big group who, you know, yep. they're working nine to five and, and just getting to training on time. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, some of these drills uh, could be used as a, in, as part of the warm up. So some pre training activation work um, through the lower limb um, is a is a really good option. Um, and then post training body weight um, conditioning, particularly hamstring strength work, so some of the Nordic work that they that they do um, easily. Something you could you could all get the guys to just do some partner Nordics, helping um, holding onto each other's ankles and um, doing some reconditioning at the end of training. Um, and then it's yeah. Then it becomes a bit about about the buy-in. So what the culture's like around their gym and strength conditioning work outside of on-field training. If we had a really minimal budget, what do you reckon, or what would you recommend as some of the key sort of equipment to include? From an upper body point of view, the work that I've I've seen in the in the gymnastics world, apart from a chin-up bar and a set of rings, you can scale. Um, upper body strength um, to any level you like, really. So um, I, I can appreciate that you're not pushing pushing the heavy weights on the bench or with dumbbells, but if you're getting guys building up to um, one arm strength work in, in pushing, I think that that suffice um, in the football world um, and, and with the pulling base work as well, like building up towards sort of one arm chin kind of work as well. Um, so I don't think you need too many, um, uh, yeah, too much of an, an equipment arsenal for upper body. And from lower body, I think I still think the barbell's probably king. And so, um, if you've got barbell or an ability to have a squat rack, I think from there you've you've got lots of things. If not, 
even any kind of, of weighted work like a kettlebell becomes very multi-purpose in that space. Do you have any like recovery protocols that you'd really recommend for like post-training, post-game the next day? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think sleep is king. Uh, so if you've, if you've got nothing else, just make sure they're getting home and getting into a well-rested state um, uh, and getting the best sleep possible. Um, outside of that, um, I mean, nutrition is probably number two. So education around around their eating habits and choices. So once you've got sleep and nutrition down pat, then you can start looking at some other things. I mean, cold exposure um, for recovery, I think more often than not, people are saying it, it, it is beneficial, whether that's individual, um, cold versus heat. Um, by and by, I think it's individual preference. Um, but, yeah, cold exposure and sauna-based work are, are, are really handy but again i think a lot of that's going to come down to um whether the players have got the resources available to get into those sort of spaces